This session is on uh, Pakistan, the Pakistan element in the Afghanistan-Pakistan conundrum. And we're very fortunate to have two uh, excellent speakers. Our first speaker will be Ambassador William Milam, but I'll call him Bill because he's a friend of mine. Uh, ambassador Milam was ambassador to Pakistan from 1998 to 2001, which was a tumultuous time even for Pakistan. Uh, including the coup in which uh, General Musharraf came to power and ousted Nawaz Sharif. Uh, he was also ambassador to Bangladesh from 1990 to 1993. He was chief of mission in Liberia, and he was a deputy assistant secretary for international finance and development. He's now a senior policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. And... Just, he's just published a new book. It literally just published Columbia University Press, Bangladesh and Pakistan, Flirting with Failure in South Asia. And it's a study about the tracks, different tracks which Bangladesh and Pakistan have taken since Bangladesh separated from Pakistan in 1991, which is a topic 71. that, 71, sorry, which is a topic that very few scholars have uh, addressed. So I look forward to reading it. I haven't had a chance yet. I received it about 10 minutes ago. Uh, our our uh, second presenter will be Dr. Hassan Abbas from the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School. He's a research uh, fellow at the Belfer Center uh, on their project on managing the Atom and International Security Program. He uh, has his PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and his research interests are Pakistan's nuclear program, religious extremism in South and Central Asia, and Islam in the West. He is also a former Pakistani government official, served in the administrations of Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and President Pervez Musharraf. He has a book, too, but I don't have a copy to show. It's uh, Pakistan's Drift into Extremism, Allah, the Army, and America's War on Terror. We've asked each of our presenters to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. And after that, we will have questions. The first questions, as this morning, will be from students who've been selected to be first respondents. Uh, and then we'll open it to general questions from the floor. Bill? Oh, thank you. Well, thanks, Jeff. And uh, thank you to the center and all of you who had anything to do with inviting me. It was a, a nice trip up, except that uh, it was almost as confusing getting on the airplane in uh, Washington as it was when I used to get on airplanes in Islamabad. I never knew if I was on the right plane. <laughs> and this morning was no different, but I made it here somehow. And I'm really uh, pleased to see you all here because uh, I, you know, it's 440 and, and you're still around. I'm, I'm absolutely astonished on a Friday afternoon. You must have come to hear up Hassan because I'm sure you, it wasn't for me. But thank you anyway. Now, Jeff asked me, uh, he, well, I asked him first, what should I talk about? And he wrote back uh, an email and he said, talk about how the U.S. should deal with Pakistan. And I said, well, thanks a lot, Jeff. Why don't you give me a challenge? Yeah. Uh, but I will. I am planning to talk about that. And uh, I will sort of start with uh, some um, things that I think you have to, uh, to think about and do. And the first thing is you really have to understand Pakistan and its many, many um, problems, complexities, and detours from the vision that its founder had 62 years ago. Uh, and these have really, I think, in a, in a way, distorted its development, uh, which has led now to the kind of conundrums we have with, with Pakistan. I'll get into those later. But the uh, Part of the things you have to understand is how intertwined, and by the way, this is part of what the book is about, uh, part of how religion is intertwined with the Pakistani life but, and Pakistani politics and the development of Pakistani society uh, in, a way, in ways which have not always been uh, healthy. In fact, sometimes have been toxic. For example, uh, 
The national debate, the, the debate in Pakistan for 62 years has uh, been pr primarily, at least, over its national identity. Is Pakistan going to be what its founder envisioned, the homeland for Muslims and other minorities of South Asia? Well, we're well beyond that now, so you can't really ask that question, but could it have been? Maybe. Or is it going to be the Islamist state that uh, religious groups, Islamist groups, have been working towards with single-mindedness uh, since 19, even before 1947 really, but, uh, in 19, from 1940 when the Pakistan movement really gathered uh, steam. Um, now Jinnah is in, in, in part responsible for this at the same time as, uh, as defining a vision for the country. He, in the, in the early days, in the days before Pakistan became independent, was quite ambiguous about the nature of the state. Why? Well, he needed everybody. He needed all the Muslims who were supporting him to keep supporting him and particularly to vote for Muslim League candidates. So, I mean, the, the fault, I guess, partially his and, and the many uh, advisors he had who felt the same way about the state as he did, but this has troubled uh, the state of Pakistan, the country of Pakistan, ever since its inception. There has been a, a, a creep, singular creep towards an Islamic state, towards Islamic uh, doctrines and Islamist, uh, uh, the Islamist philosophies. Part of that is because the religious parties, the Islamists, uh, have a quite singular vision about things, and particularly the extremist elements among them uh, have relatively Leninist kinds of tactics and strategies, uh, which they use uh, quite uh, successfully sometimes. Jinnah's vision has been bargained away over the last 60 years uh, with in bits and pieces, sliced and diced as we would say, by various deals. I call them Faustian bargains, although that may imply uh, dealing with the devil and I don't mean to imply that. But the Faustian bargains uh, were basically deals between civil politicians or, and, or, and or the military, whichever was running the country at the time, and Islamist elements, which, as I said, traded away uh, some of these, uh, some of the liberal, more secular visions that the state started with. The Objectives Resolution was probably the first manifestation of this, 1949, two years after uh, the, in, the founding of the state, one year after Jinnah's death. And this has continued on and on and on. Zulfi Ali Bhutto, who was uh, a secular, liberal leader, people thought, at least he le led a secular, liberal life, uh, made a, a number of deals while he was in power, uh, giving away little bits and slices of, of, uh, of shall we say, the liberal... Uh, uh, philosophy, liberal governance. Uh, Nawaz Sharif, who is still around, has, has made his own deals with uh, the Islamists. He, in fact, if you recall, uh, when he was overthrown by General Musharraf, was proposing a that Sharia, that there be a constitutional amendment making Sharia law the, the law of the land, it was for him a pragmatic thing. I don't believe he's, he's an Islamist or really believed in Sharia, but I believe he thought he could get the Islamists with him. And he was trying, uh, he had his own view about subordinating the military, which was not a bad objective, but perhaps he went around it, he went about it the wrong way. Anyway, that was part of the problem, part of the reason, I think, having talked to a lot of senior military officers, why they moved against him when they did. These deals continue to this day. I mean, the, you, you could look upon the SWAT deal as just a continuation of this kind of bargaining with, uh, with these guys. So 
that's you have to be aware of that kind of element in Pakistan in, in Pakistani development. You have to be aware of some of the cultural and uh, mindset problems that you run into. Pakistan, you know, has been called a nationalist country but not a nation. Uh, and I think there's some truth in that. In fact, there was a book written about it by, with that title. It means that they've developed a nationalist ideology uh, and yet it has never really been a nation, never really had a national feeling. It's a hodgepodge, was when it began, a hodgepodge of nationality, speaking uh, many different languages, and remains to some extent uh, a, very, a country of various nationalities. Uh, the other thing I like to point out about the Pakistan political class, the establishment, uh, is that for some reason, although the most Pakistanis, if you, uh, the average Pakistani uh, thinks very highly of education and wants to be educated, the uh, establishment has a very low regard for public education. And as we all know, uh, the public education system has in, in fact collapsed. Uh, there is now in Pakistan a choice between private schools, which are mainly English medium schools, or madrasas. There used to be, I don't know if you were uh, an, a, a graduate of the Urdu medium schools, but uh, there used to be a real strong Urdu medium school system there, but it's mainly gone now. And that's too bad. You get madrasa graduates who study the Quran no, and know Arabic, but haven't really got any skills to deal with the 21st century. You get English speakers who haven't learned their national language, or at least learned to write it. They may know enough, uh, they may speak it well enough to speak to the servants. Uh, and you get 50% uh, an, of the population which is illiterate. And that's one of the other problems of Pakistan is that illiteracy, uh, you have an illiterate population which is, looks to guidance quite a lot by semi-literate uh, mullahs uh, out of the madrasas. So um, you've got, that's another problem. The political culture, I'll just give you this in a sentence, is uh, not unusual for the third world, but it's, it's not helpful. It's a patron-client kind of relationship run by feudals, industrialists, and so forth. The other issue that I really want to point out, uh, they're, they're connected. This has to do with culture and mindset, is one, what I call India-centricity. Since 1947, um, in, uh, Pakistan has regarded India as its existential enemy, as the enemy who would uh, conquer it if it could. And all issues, <laughs> All foreign policy and security issues have been viewed through the issue, through the lens of India. Uh, that has led, uh, and has, is part of what has led at least, to the growth of what I call Praetorianism, that is the dominance of the army in politics. The army identifies, has been able to identify itself with the national interest through this India centricity in part. Um, and it has an, managed to convince a great many Pakistanis that it is the protector of national interests. This, of course, complicates our, the issues that we're dealing with today because the army, to a great extent, still faces east. Now, there is a bunch of, there are some divisions in the west. And we know that they're fighting sometimes. Uh, but but um, the eastward orientation of the army is still a problem when you get to the problems that we're dealing with today, which is fighting the existential threat from the West. Uh, the army is uh, uh, dominant uh, or, and sees a, an interest in remaining dominant because it has a vested interest in the economy, having invested much uh, into, in the economy. And it has uh, placed a lot of retired army officers around in different economic and governmental organizations. And this has also led to the armies uh, exerting a claim on 
national resources disproportionate to either its needs or uh, its size. Which, of course, if, if, if you play budget zero-sum games, takes away from the, the money that might, probably not, but might be available to social development, education, and so forth. So you have to understand that sort of complex history uh, if you're going to deal with Pakistan. Second, now this is uh, something that I want to uh, mention because the book that I've just written is called Flirting with Failure. And I want to point out that that title has been the working title since the day I started writing this book, which is four, five, six years ago. This was long before this existential threat from the jihadists was apparent. But there have been, there are plenty of problems that face Pakistan in, in 2001, 2002, 2003. In fact, in 1995 and 1985, Pakistan's running out of water. It has a terrible, it's going to have a terrible water crisis one of these days. The economy has been basically uh, stagnant for, for over many years. It's been up and down. Uh, it, it, when it's up, it's usually from some sort of uh, monetary um, in, uh, ex, you know, increase in the money supply, which was probably a bad idea, which then leads to inflation, which then leads to the current account falling and getting in trouble. Um, it, uh, the investment in the country has been low, uh, both uh, domestic and foreign investment. I mentioned the illiteracy, they have an illiterate workforce, a workforce that is not competitive anywhere in Asia, even with Bangladesh, the other part of this book here, where Bangladesh has been, has, uh, you know, increased literacy considerably, including and especially female literacy. In Pakistan, not much is done. Uh, so these are the kinds of uh, things we're dealing with, and it gets to the point of failure. Now, I am not sure what failure would look like in Pakistan, but I can tell you what it won't look like. It won't look like the failure that I've seen elsewhere, like in Liberia, or that we read about in Somalia. The government's not going to disappear. The place is not going to uh, fall into the kind of warlord anarchy that you see in classical failed states, if that's a, a correct term. What you're going to see is something different, and it's going to be something that probably uh, harks back to what Jack said this morning, something about you know, the growth of ungoverned territory and the growth in that ungoverned territory of toxic elements, jihadists, ta Taliban, Al-Qaeda, who want to harm the West, harm the United States, but also harm the countries around Pakistan, not just Afghanistan, but India and others. So at some point, I guess I'll define failure by saying we'll know it when we see it, like pornography, but uh, I, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to look now, but it will lo not look like Liberia looked when I was there. So, now we come to the question that, that Jeff asked me to answer. How do we deal with Pakistan? I turn over the page and what do I see? The answer is with difficulty. But I think I can give you some principles uh, that might we might want to think about uh, and our government might want to think about as it uh, deals, tries to deal with Pakistan. And maybe at the end of this, I'll give you a couple of comments about the Obama plan or the Obama strategy that was just announced last week. So what, are, what would be my principles if I were uh, running this uh, strategy? Well, first of all, I would make sure that it's got to be, and it's got to be thought of and carried out as a long-term strategy. And we have to convince the Pakistanis that we're there, that we're going to stay there until the job is done. Uh, the, when, if you ask me to define the job being done, I mean that 
somehow or the other, Afghanistan is, uh, is free of the danger of Taliban and or Al-Qaeda, uh, and that we are going to stay in that part of the world until we, until we, until we get rid of those kinds of elements. We must send signals from Afghanistan uh, on that. And part of this, I'll comment on this later, part of the uh, program that I think, or the uh, strategy that I think was announced, I worry about some of the signals it's sending. Jack and Lisa talked this morning about what I, who people I think are called the minimalists for Afghanistan. Uh, people who really don't want to do much except sort of stay, keep their heads down, try to stabilize the situation and get out as soon as you can. Um, and we must, at all costs, if we're going to convince the Pakistanis we mean business, uh, make sure that they don't believe that the minima, minimalists are controlling our strategy and our policy. So we have to show a sustained interest in them and in building their institutions, and I think perhaps, and mainly their civilian institutions. That is why I think, among other things, the one and a half billion dollar economic assistance package, although we haven't seen much in the terms of detail, um, for such things as education and health and uh, judicial independence even, uh, is good. That is why I think that military assistance, the change in the mix between economic assistance and military assistance is also good. But if I understand it correctly and that there's $3 billion uh, scheduled for military assistance, I still think that we may want to think about that package and that total. Seems like a whole lot to me. And Hassan and I had a conversation earlier this afternoon and. There wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a bad idea to put some of that into the police, I think. Now, the, this assistance, the one, one of the things we're going to have to do, and believe me, I know how hard this is because I've tried to oversee programs like this in not only in Pakistan but in several other countries, we've got to see that the, it is delivered in a timely way and an effective way, and it's well targeted. Um, I've heard from pretty reputable Pakistani friends that when we tried, when we uh, tried to give them, or when we gave them, actually it wasn't a gift, when we uh, transferred to them what we would call counterinsurgency equipment, helicopters, uh, at attack helicopters, and night vision goggles, that we were 18 months to two years late in delivering them. And then I heard this silly story, which I'm not sure I believe, that in fact the, at least one set of night vision goggles, one for one division of the uh, Pakistani army or the Frontier Corps, had to be collected every Friday night and taken back, taken back to the American base and then reissued on Monday morning. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, who knows? Anyway, we've got to be much better at delivering things. Now, our, our strategy has to be aimed at psychological things as well as material things. Because at the bottom of our difficulties in Pakistan are mindset problems the mindset that Jack talked about, that we were, we're always bailing out when the going gets tough. We did in 1990, and those Pakistanis with longer memories think that we abandoned them in 1965 uh, and in 1971, really. Uh, although we made more bellicose noises in 71. Uh, but they think that we have been, and probably will remain a sometime friend, one who uh, gets out when the going gets tough. And leaves, and, and we, they think that we leave Pakistan to pick up the pieces. That's what they uh, 
thought we did in, in 1990 in Afghanistan. Now, the Obama strategy to deal with these uh, ambiguities and impediments has got to be a little bit better fleshed out, but I, it, it, I consider it a mixed bag at this point, but there are some very strong elements to it. First of all, I think overtly, at least in abstract, overtly it sends a very strong signal of our determination to stay and get the job done in Afghanistan. And it demonstrates this through more troops to Afghanistan, through more and better development assistance in Afghanistan, and through the money that we will, uh, uh, tr that we're talking about transferring to Pakistan, both for economic assistance and uh, military assistance. As I said, it's vague on the details of the economic assistance, but that's not so bad. I mean, as it was explained to me uh, uh, the other day in a meeting, that uh, it's a structure and it can be, uh, it's a framework rather, not a structure, it's a framework and it can be adjusted as we go, as we, we go along and need to adjust it. The other thing it requires uh, that uh, I don't see much mention of, it, and I certainly don't see any details about it, is a much more creative and effective public diplomacy outreach. You know that right now, I'm sure Hassan could talk about this better than me. Much of the public media in Pakistan is purveying the idea that this is not, that this struggle with the extremists is not theirs, is not Pakistan's struggle, it's an American struggle. And some television commentators and others go so far as to say, if the Americans would only go away so would the bad guys. Uh, well, I think we know how far-fetched that is, but a great many Pakistanis believe it. And it's going to take a long time, this gets back to the long-term uh, thinking, and a lot of effort to reverse that. And it's not, we can't just reverse it with public diplomacy, but we can work at it. But we also can reverse it by these programs I've talked about, the economic assistance that gets down to the, uh, down to the people, education, health care, things that they know are coming from the U.S. Uh, police uh, assistance that, uh, from, the, from the U.S. to the police would be uh, well thought of. Um, I am worried about one part of our of this strategy that is not terribly well enunciated, but people have talked about it over and over again, and, and it was mentioned this morning, and that is this idea of sorting out the bad, the good, and the indifferent Taliban. Uh, I have a bias here, I admit. Uh, I was one of those who talked to the Taliban for three years while I was in Islamabad. And I used to write to Washington and say, because there were these questions even then, well, can you find a moderate Taliban? And I used to say it's a non sequitur. There is no such thing. Now, there are hangers on in the tally, with the Taliban, not just thieves and drug peddlers and those kinds, who can be separated from the Taliban. Uh, but the, uh, there, and there probably are some moderate Taliban uh, no, there probably aren't, but there are some Taliban you can buy more cheaply than others, actually, is what it is. Uh, but, um, so, but I think that, that all this talk and implicit in the strategy is sorting out these Taliban, and I think that is a terrible signal that, to send to the Pakistanis. These are Afghan Taliban. First of all, picking good from bad Taliban is what the Paks or Pakistanis are doing right now. I mean, in, up in the tribal areas, they've got their Afghan Taliban, who they like, and their Pakistani Taliban, who they don't like and who don't like them. But, and they're helping one and, and trying to kill the other, uh, sometimes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bad signal from that point of view. It also implies, I think, that, the, uh, that there's a strain of minimalism, if I can go back to that word, in 
our strategy for Afghanistan. And as long as there's a scent, even a whiff, of minimalism in our Afghan strategy, you will still have this uh, paradox, ambiguity among the Pakistanis. On the one hand, wanting to protect themselves, and on the other hand, thinking that they need to keep their hand in in Afghanistan because when we finally do leave, they think, they'll be left holding the bag again. Now, of course, that doesn't even get to the point of uh, the Taliban policies and, and beliefs, uh, which are an anathema, uh, most of which are an anathema to most of us. But anyway, I think that uh, overall uh, the strategy is a good start. I would like to see uh, it revised somewhat. But I think that if I have to leave you with a final thought, it would be that uh, if we're serious, we're in this for a long time, and we've got to be serious about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. We're going to go directly to Hassan Abbas's presentation, and then we'll go to questions. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> It's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. And let me first also thank the um, previous speakers. I, I consider myself um, their student in some ways. Milam, Jack, and Lisa have greatly learned from their uh, writings, their, their, their statements. I'm also thankful to the students um, at Middlebury primarily for one reason. I, I have this blog uh, called Vatan Dost. And um, there's a small site meter, which often the, all those who blog, they want to see how many people visit their website. So irrespective of how many come, at times there are 25% of all visits to my blog are from middlebury.edu. So, <laughs> so whether those are, those are five or six, thank you very much. <laughs> I have called, um, I have framed um, my talk as a South Asian perspective, and I'll tell you why. Um, it happens once in a while, although I live in this country and this is my adopted homeland for the last 10 years. Um, it happens when I'm in DC or in academia and my American friends don't like what I say and they say, oh, this is a Pakistani view. Uh, and I say, well, by the same token, your view is an American view. Uh, so I thought now that I'm so often blamed um, for, for being giving a Pakistani view. Let's call it a South Asian view and, and explain my position. What I plan to do today is um, to show you some pictures uh, and take you through the story of Pakistan, what happened, uh, what is happening today, can we rescue it, all these questions through, through these pictures. Um, and some of the questions that I would like to answer in the process of showing you these about 15 or 20 pictures, the questions are, uh, of course, the major question, can Pakistan be rescued? Um, secondly, uh, what we know about these sanctuaries of Al-Qaeda, Taliban in the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region, why and how those sanctuaries are there? Because today, as we know, in the AFPAC policy review, we know of this about seven billion dollar aid to Pakistan. This is not the first time U.S. is giving aid to Pakistan. U.S. has given aid to Pakistan since early 1950s. I don't know of percentage, but it must be more than 80 percent aid has always been military. The point I'm making right at the beginning, if despite all that massive investment in Pakistan military, despite that we have sanctuaries, is it that military is not fighting? Is it that the, 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 this host of extremism, the, this militancy is so strong that a very disciplined, organized military uh, is being defeated, even I would say? Th these are the questions um, that I would like to answer in the process. This is a picture. This is just from yesterday. Um, Pres President Asif Ali Zadzari, Turkish President Abdullah Gul Karzai. Uh, and they were in Turkey two neighbors, Pakistan and Afghanistan, because perhaps they can't talk directly to each other. There's, there's, there's some, some lack of communication, lack of trust, or whatever, that they thought that uh, a third president, um, Turkey, would need to intervene. The reason why I chose this picture of President Obama, although it's my favorite picture, I, we, we, he must have wished that if he'll just shift his hand like this, change, and things will change. 
uh, but but it it is it is much more complicated. It is, it is much more difficult. Um, although I think that this new AFPAC policy is excellent. And, and the reason is, I'm saying it's excellent, is that I would even say for the first time, there is a very concerted, committed effort to invest in Pakistan's development. It's not that during the, uh, I'll briefly mention you three points. 1950s, Pakistan joins CETO and CENTO military alliances. Why? Because Pakistan says it will defend Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan will defend the expansion of communism. Military aid comes in, goes into Pakistan army establishment. 1980s again, Soviet Union walks into Afghanistan. Pakistan army says, oh, we are going to stop them. Again, investment goes into Pakistan military. Uh, and I have no personal bias. I am in some ways a product of a Pakistan army, being the son of an army officer, though a professor in, in, in a military academy. But I have grown up in military and have seen better hospitals, better schools. In fact, the first day when I uh, joined civil service, I was a police officer before this academic hat that I now wear. I served as a police chief um, in Northwest Frontier Province. And the first, and this uh, in Pakistan, it's a very prestigious service, a senior supervisory role. The first day I walked into a hospital in Sawabi, I was stunned. I said, this is a hospital. Why? Because being son of an army officer, I was used to go to these comparatively excellent hospitals. But different schools, different transport system, everything about army is different, and they owe this to Western international aid, because neither Pakistan has oil, nor Pakistan is producing anything else. The, the very advanced, in comparative terms, advanced institution of Pakistan military that they owe to the West. This is the first time, through FPAC policy, US is saying, no, we are going to primarily invest in Pakistan's development. Why that is important? How will that go? I should, I should actually move to the next slide. We think of Pakistan as green. Um, whether you call it Islamist, Islamism, many people use these phrases without, actually there is no clear definition, Islamic fundamentalist, Islamist, Islamism. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the general view is that it's, it's green, it's all religious, is it? No. And this, this links to Ambassador Milam's very important issue that he raised about identity. The identity of Pakistan, this is a picture primarily on some of the Pakistani websites picked up internationally. We need to look at it, Pakistan, differently. Same map, the four colors that you see are indicating four major ethnic groups. And we are just not talking about the fifth one, about which the, the, the Ambassador Milam's book also mentions that there was a fifth uh, ethnic group which was part of Pakistan, 1,000 miles away, uh, East Pakistan or Bangladesh. Let's even leave that. But even today, there are these four different ethnic groups. And they're not confined in Pakistan. And this you'll see if you have to understand Middle East or you have to understand South Asia or even Central Asia. This point will come again and again. Um, as you'll see the green, leave even all the, these three others, though very clearly, even Punjab is divided between Pakistan and India. Baluchistan is divided between Pakistan and Iran. Uh, the most important, Pashtuns or Pathans, who are divided between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Just see the green area, How, though that in terms of numbers, there are more Pathans in Pakistan, but the, the area-wise, uh, where they live, that's more in Afghanistan. This borderline that you see between this, this is on the sand. It was in 1893, 1893 when a, a British um, official, Mr. Duran, had walked in there, uh, having never been to this region, had just drew a line on the map. It remains a line on, on these paper maps. On the border, people who are relatives, friends, um, culturally, their ethnic relations, their blood relations, their joint properties across this border. It is very easy to say today, these are sanctuaries or these are Pathans or, or militants who are going from one side or the other. That is what they have been doing historically. They live on both sides of the divide. It is a very mountainous region. It is very difficult to control. Yes, we should be more concerned about the new ideology that they have taken up. Historically, they were Maliks, these tribal leaders. You can go to them, you can have a deal. I'm, I'll not call them secular, but nonetheless, they would open you with open arms, uh, irrespective of your religion, color, or wh whosoever you are. Now, it is the radical, the young radical who has taken over. 
about 300 of the Pashtun Maliks, I'm talking about this green, uh, this line, uh, dividing line between Pakistan and Afghanistan in, in the green area. Now, those 300 of the tribal leaders have been murdered, butchered, and young radicals have taken over. That is more of an issue. Whether Pakistan, Afghanistan border will ever be properly controlled, I doubt it very much. Let's go to the next picture. If the previous one looked complicated, this shows the different ethnic groups who live in this whole region. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbeks, uh, even within Afghanistan, the kind of issues, um, ethnic issues, other issues, but why ethnicity? By the way, the, the, the question for, for students to, to think about, when this ethnic identity becomes important, in most cases, it becomes important when there's economic crisis, when there are grievances, when there are problems about their fights or wars about resources, these ethnic identities become more problematic. And because of war, because of economic chaos in this area, these ethnic identities are um, very important. Um, just to give you one anecdote here, um, when I was in police in Pakistan, in the border area, uh, there was a time when uh, there was a major raid that was to be conducted in the tribal area. I was in, there's a district called Sawabi, S-W-A-B-I. It's a settled area. Uh, but because I went to the Fata, why my team had to go there? Because these Pashtuns uh, from this one tribe I'll not name, uh, was well known that they are experts in stealing Mercedes vehicles. Anywhere in Karachi, Lahore, Peshawar, they, you want, you see a Mercedes, you of course can't get or pay for it. Go to that specific tribe, or members of that tribe, they'll get it for you. So we had this information. I went there with, with about 50 people. Um, this is 1997. Uh, I'm just thinking again because it is being recorded also, how much I can say. Uh, <laughs> but let's say we, I, I went there. We couldn't find that guy who we were looking for. Um, we raided the house. Um, not, uh, it was not a military operation, so there was no kind of fight. But um, some, some of my staff was a bit rude because they opened the door by force because they were raiding a place looking for an absconder. As soon as uh, this operation finished, we couldn't find this person. Uh, the, the elder of the family came, and he said to me that, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Sawabi. I'm chief of police and assist, assistant superintendent of police in Sawabi. He said, no, no, what is your ethnic background? I said, I'm a Punjabi. I'm from Punjab, this other region I, that I showed you. And he said, so you're a guest? I said, no, no, no. I'm a police chief from just adjacent area. He said, no, no, you are a guest in, for Pashtuns. He asked me, you have to now, because you're a guest, you have to sit, eat with us. Excellent food was brought in. And I, when I tried, I was a bit reluctant. I asked, well, I asked my staff, they said, no, sir. When we raided the place, we got away with that. Even we broke his door. If we we'll refuse food, he's not going to leave you. So you have to take food. And that, again, that is, what would you call? Was it religious? Was it ethnic? No, this was tribal culture. People generally were very open. Today, um, being a Punjabi, possibly I'll not even dare go close to that region. Or people who even belong to that area. Unless they belong to a certain sect or a certain viewpoint, religious viewpoint, within the larger Islamic world. Things have changed in last 10 years in such a way. This is the picture. Mira, maybe this is a route possibly when, when you were in in Pakistan and you had to go to see uh, General Karamat, the army chief, probably you went through this road. This is connecting between Rawalpindi and Islamabad. This is a truck with Osama bin Laden's picture behind it. Again, I'm not showing, I'm not saying that this is, Osama bin Laden is very popular, but 10 years before, ago, this was impossible. Uh, yes, there will be a picture of one person, General Ayub Khan, who was Pakistan's head of the state, young, smart, known for his secular views. Uh, not, the picture was not there because he was secular, but he was a popular guy. His, if your picture is behind a truck, I mean, that's an indication of your popularity in Pakistan. People paint, that is one way to judge. And Ayub Khan, every, behind every truck, um, very beautiful decorated trucks, you'll find the big pictures of Ayub Khan. This is a picture from, I think, five or six months ago published in a newspaper. This is again inconceivable uh, why nobody stopped him or even again there was no, not enough reason to stop anybody just because he has a picture of Osama bin Laden but, but that again tells you something. These, these kind of indicators show at times um, 
how, how some groups, how some people are viewing somebody. Another issue, if you have to understand today, many people forget what happened uh, with Benazir Bhutto. Who was she? What she stood for? And um, also a small anecdote here. Be be before I had served with Benazir Bhutto very briefly with, as a staff officer and then with her husband who is now the president of Pakistan for about six to eight months. I was their personal staff officer. I was in touch with Benazir. Ten or twelve days before her death, uh, I sent her an email. And I'm mentioning this because this will be published. This was published in a Guardian, um, very well-known newspaper. Again, it is being published in a, a different book. When I, I wrote an article about this attack, which happened the first day when Benazir Bhutto, after a long exile, landed back in Pakistan. Uh, there was uh, hundreds of thousands of people came out on the streets. Again, there the are small messages uh, embedded in all the narrative that I, I have. Benazir Bhutto, if you'll tell any um, Westerner, for instance, who's not aware, um, a woman uh, in a Muslim land where all these people have these Osama bin Laden's pictures on their trucks. What? Why these hundreds of th and thousands of people came out on the street to receive her? Yes, some were her supporters because of ethnic background, some because of her father. But nonetheless, hundreds and thousands of people looked at her as a sign of hope also. They came, there was a major massive bombing attack, 200 people died. I wrote an article, um, who tried to kill Benazir Bhutto? And I sent it to her. She was very kind. God bless her soul, she would, would always respond very quickly to emails through her BlackBerry. She sent me in BlackBerry, which I, I still have uh, in here, and I, I, that, that's what this Guardian saw this and uh, published this after checking all the records. Benazir wrote, uh, I had said to her, Benazir, either Baitullah Masood tried to kill you, this was October 27th, either Baitullah Masood tried to kill you, or um, maybe some other extremist groups, I named some, uh, Jaish Muhammad, Lashkar-e Taiba, Lashkar Jangvi, I named some and said that maybe now you are back there, tell Musharraf, who is then the president, talk to these militant groups. Someone, one of them has done it. What Benazir wrote back to me is very insightful. Just two sentences. And go to Guardian, Google it and you'll find it. The exact statement, the exact quote. She said, Hassan, this is not my, one who try, tried to kill me, I'm paraphrasing, one who tried to kill me was not the one who Americans think he might be, there's somebody from within the intelligence military infrastructure. She knew that somebody in the Pakistan military, in the intelligence services, whatever she meant, within the infrastructure who wanted to kill. Why I have a picture here? Because maybe um, our American friends in, in, DC, in DC, now that the government has changed, have forgotten about her. Uh, but it was very important for Pakistan. She was one of the last hopes. When an arrangement was being made with Jal Musharraf as some very important American officials as guarantors, and they couldn't tell Benazir Bhutto once she was there that she has to be secured. Again, as we know, life and death is not in our hands always. Uh, there can be a road accident also. But she, till the end, was asking about security. Senator Kerry is on record. Senator Kerry had um, demanded that. He had conveyed that in writing. That document is now uh, on YouTube, actually. That uh, he asked the Bush administration to ensure. Again, I'm not saying somebody in this country was responsible. But when you guarantee something, you are part of a deal, her supporters, I'll not say even maybe her family members, they think American, Americans betrayed them. This is a view. This may not be true. This is but how these things better. When political leaders, when U.S. involvement is so much um, there in, in the political process, and Benazir Bhutto died, yes, whosoever killed her from within the system or outside the system, but the fact remains that there was very little security around her. Uh, so the, these things again matter, and um, she was a very important a symbol of what she stood for. Who could have stopped that? Let me come jump to a different thing. Uh, police those militants who killed Benazir Bhutto, let's say, or who are conducting terrorist attacks. Just a few figures. 2007, there were 61 suicide attacks. 2008, 66 suicide attacks in Pakistan. 2009, um, so far, 13 suicide attacks. These suicide bombers come from Fata or elsewhere. According to my basic question is, 
in any society or state, who is the primary responsible institution for dealing with criminal, criminals, militants of any sort, when they were, um, in fact, uh, religious extremists within US, abortion clinics were uh, bombed, as you know. Was it US military or Pentagon that went in? No, it will be local police always. Um, I don't want to go into details, but the, within the political science theory also, and they, there's an excellent report, RAND, R-A-N-D, RAND, the famous uh, think tank, their report in 2008 says, that these two scholars who collected a lot of data wherever counter-terrorism efforts are afoot, and they said that in countries where terrorism, uh, counter-terrorism measures succeeded, police had played a major role. Another study about counter-insurgency even. Law, civilian law enforcement plays a major role. Yes, in counter-insurgency, they have to be supported with, by the military. They, there has to be political will. There are other variables also. But police is the basic institution. Here is the picture of Pakistan police. Uh, you, you can guess, uh, of course, people would stand behind, but the one who's up uh, sitting at the roof because there's no other vehicle that he could go into. There's a vehicle which pe police is pushing um, just because they are short of gas, most probably. In this case, um, you see the equipment without any shoes. He's just came out. He, why this police officer has... Uh, is trying to hide his face. The reason is the terrorists in Pakistan had targeted those police officials, judges, who were gutsy enough or courageous enough to go against these militant groups. Being a former police officer, having talked to many of my colleagues, police has no, neither been given resources nor support. At times, why police cannot go after some of the militant groups in Pakistan is that they say that those militants you could give them any name, terrorists, jihadis, extremists, whatever name or brand name you give them, that some of them were used by Pakistan's state, military and intelligence services in Afghanistan, in Kashmir. And those are the assets of Pakistan's security infrastructure. When police will go after them, they are often stopped. But this, this picture is just to, to explain lack of resources. Um, my last visit to, to this place where I had served as a police officer four, four or five months ago, uh, the vehicles in those police stations were the same that I left in 1998. Compare that with Army. Compare that with Pakistan's Air Force. Just pick up the record of the last eight years of the Bush administration, how many F-16s were given, how many tanks were given, for instance, or in money for even counter-terrorism that was given to Pakistan. How much of that was spent on Pakistan's police? Very little. Just one figure, 2007, 791 million was given to Pakistan Army. 791 million to Pakistan Army, year 2007. How much was given to police that in that year? 4.3 million. Again, when I checked in records in Pakistan where that 4.3 million was used, that was used just for salaries rather than expanding the infrastructure, adding to their capacity, that uh, money was uh, used just for salaries. Government was covering up for budget deficit. That's why it is all the more important that when this, this $1.5 billion was given to Pakistan every year by this uh, new Obama administration, there has to be a very clear and strong accountability. It, US, the, of some officials have to be there who will see where that money is being spent. Uh, in, uh, there was a project for giving, uh, supporting education reforms. Um, Ibn Ahmed very rightly mentioned Pakistan's public education system is collapsing. And uh, when that money was, um, US had given a big chunk of money in 2004. I was partly involved as a, as a consultant. The interesting thing was that a big chunk of money was given that was divided in eight international NGOs. Those eight international NGOs from USAID were supposed to go into Pakistan. Ultimately, about 30 to 40 percent of the money went into Pakistan only because there were eight different international agencies in between. Uh, then those consultants who went into Pakistan received money in dollars. Then even the 30 percent that was used in Pakistan uh, was through the Pakistan's Ministry of Education, which bungled most of the money. Some of the consultants were picked up uh, even in Pakistan, but those who were 
um, sons or son-in-laws or daughters or daughter-in-laws of important politicians who perhaps had education abroad, could speak an excellent British or American accent, but couldn't go and talk to people in local languages. So, I mean, these things are important. You throw in a lot of money. After five years, we'll say, where that $7 billion has gone. The, these um, mechanisms, processes, these, these are very, very crucial. One other important factor in terms of how to understand Pakistan today, this is the picture of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Something very significant happened in Pakistan in the last two years. Um, missed by, I would say, initially by the media, also by the experts and analysts. Uh, what had happened was Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary, whose picture who is now again the Chief, Sec uh, Chief uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, was thrown out, sent home by Musharraf. He was mishandled. Uh, on the street when he refused, he wanted to go to office despite Musharraf's order. He was mishandled. That was shown on live television in Pakistan. Pakistan today has 57 news channels, 24-7, uh, that they're, they're showing what's happening. Yes, as Milamid rightly said, at times they, they are very conservative. But nonetheless, this is for the first time, the ordinary people see what is happening. When they saw the Chief Justice of Pakistan being mishandled on a street by an ordinary cop on the street, there was a revolt. Revolt in a sense that lawyers from all across, yes, Pakistan has court, courts, a legal system, contrary to the, these some just very general presumptions or pictures that we get. Pakistan's bar councils all across Pakistan, they came out on the street, committed, galvanized, fought Musharraf for two years, came out on the streets, beaten. Every other, this is Islamabad police beating a lawyer. There, well, another well-known lawyer is taken on the side. But this movement, this was missed in the West. Why? It is very important to uh, try to, for, for any of the students, try to find out, maybe call some of the journalists in Boston Globe, New York Times, LA Times, for the first six months, seven months, when this movement was on, why West missed it? First, because there are, because I'm supposed to give you a Pakistani and or South Asian perspective to let, let, let me be a bit uh, provocative. Partly because we thought, uh, well, it's a third world country. These guys, they, they know what is court, what is a lawyer, what do they know about rule of law? At times, these are the assumptions in the minds of the West. That this third world, developing world, they don't know. They don't deserve democracy. They cannot be democratic. Well, no. People came out on the streets, got beaten, inspired, motivated. They sent Musharraf home, primarily. Yes, there were other reasons. Um, political parties played a role. But what actually counted was that not only that Musharraf was removed, when this justice was not reinstated, people came out on the streets, not in a very organized fashion. Yes, some crimin criminals, some religious parties also got involved in the act. But through street power, they ensured that he is reinstated. As I have said, yes, religious parties also benefited, but they were human rights activists. Go and Google human rights activists South Asia. The top three names that will come up on, this, on, on the websites will be Pakistanis. Asma Jahangir is one. Uh, there were many scholars, academics, journalists, human rights activists who played a role, who were involved in this movement. Why I am taking this much time to, to talk about this? They are the hope. If Obama's new plan of $7 billion will not be translated into support for such elements, then again, this money will be wasted. That's why it is important to acknowledge these signs of hope. It, it, in my view, this was a massive or major phenomenon. But even by all standards, let's say, even by a purely absolutely neutral objective view, um, who's not emotional about Pakistan like me, maybe, even then you'll see that uh, the, the number of people who came out on the streets, um, the way they uh, took a stand and stood by it, for never, um, never compromised, that is an important positive sign, which, in my view, may in the end save Pakistan. These again are the pictures from, from those scenes. There are other players also in Pakistan. This is the Prime Minister of Pakistan, um, Gilani, and the Army Chief. And very important person, there's a reason why his picture is big, uh, Nawaz Sharif. Uh, uh, a political leader who, in, I would, if I have to guess, in six months or one year will be um, most likely Pakistan's new leader. Uh, he's known for a very short 
span of attention. He can, he can focus on something for a very brief time. Uh, this is well known about him. One of the things that interest him most in life is food. And, and again, this is uh, pretty well known. Uh, but he's very popular because he supported a cause um, in, in this case, which was important. Let me go back to a picture about just to very briefly talk about. I know uh, I have hardly a five minute, five more minutes. Militant groups in Pakistan, how strong they are. They are indeed very strong. There are about 26 different militant groups um, who are running their show, organized, work through madrasas and mosques. And they have taken up this cause of converting Pakistan into a theocratic or theological state. Uh, it's not that they go out to propagate through books and publications. Uh, no, they have adopted violent ways, as you, as you know. When these um, suicide bombers or militants come across from Fata or elsewhere um, inside Pakistan, they benefit from these logistical um, support base within Pakistan, which is a new thing, which is, has happened in the last eight to 10 years. Previously, most of these militant groups, sectarian, regional militant groups, those that were used by Pakistan in Kashmir, uh, also to, to go and create problems from their viewpoint, supporting freedom movement, but those which were involved, all those groups have now uh, become, despite being banned, what they do is they change their titles. One group, Lashkar-e Taiba, uh, well known, which was uh, allegedly involved in, in um, attacks on India, when they were banned, they were, I was on their listserv. They have their listservs, and they would send you their new press releases. When they were banned, in 24 hours, I received an email that our website is being shut down. Don't worry. In next 24 hours, you'll receive a new email address or new, uh, uh, sorry, new website address. They are at, in Punjab and in Karachi. They come from educated backgrounds. They are technologically savvy. They, they know how to use internet. If you just go to YouTube and uh, say Zaid, their person, na person by the name of Zaid, Z-A-I-D, Zaid Hamid, H-A-M-I-D. And you'll find his lectures. Uh, Zaid, is there some fan of Zaid Hamid or no? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's very conservative and extremist. I, have, I would like to know what you think. Uh, those kind of extremists who have a very different vision of Pakistan are becoming quite popular. Uh, and state lacks the capacity, lacks the will also to challenge them. Uh, these extremists who six or ten, ten years ago, I'm, I'm saying again ten years because ten years ago I was living there. I, uh, um, when I go to Pakistan today, the kind of difference that I see is, is huge uh, in mainstream discourse, in discussing these, the capacities of these militant groups. So by, by showing you those lawyers and all those pictures, I was not saying that these militants or extremists are not there. They're there. But we need to look at uh, the other side as well. Very quickly, this is a picture of Benazir Bhutto with Rajiv Gandhi in 1988. Uh, a meeting which is not often quoted today, which was they also talked about uh, nuclear issues, uh, about um, a deal or, or an agreement that they not attack uh, Pakistan, the, each other's nuclear installations. This was in 1988. In my view, if Pakistan has to be rescued, you, we have to go to that one same point. Rajiv Gandhi was also killed by extremists and militants. Um, Sri Lankan, whosoever, uh, in India. Benazir Bhutto, as we have already talked about here. But Pakistan will have to go back and adjust to its surroundings. There's an entrenched view in Pakistan's military security establishment that India is out to destroy. Previous speakers talked about it. That phobia is very much entrenched in the mindset of Pakistan's security establishment. But you go to rural Sindh, rural Punjab, not rural Punjab, maybe NWFP, Balochistan, have a referendum. How many of, of the ordinary people will say they are ready to give up all their life property and everything for the cause of Kashmir or India in rivalry with India. I, in my estimate, again, in the statistics, one cannot guess, but all the indicators are there probably will not be more than 25% of the country. But if you take the same referendum in the military uh, infrastructure or the elite, which, which benefits 
from these aids and military deals, uh, then you see a higher percentage. So the way forward would be, in my view, ultimately, uh, peace process with India. This is a picture in Sawat, where um, one Sufi Muhammad was addressing some people, which was, again, um, could not have been conceived. Who can challenge them? Pakistan military. Uh, why they have not put their act together, whether it is a lack of counterinsurgency skills, as we say, or is it that they have old relationships with them, or maybe that army is not ready to attack its own people directly because then it creates a different impression. Militants, extremists benefit. They say Pakistan army, rather than uh, doing anything on the borders, is killing its own people, and then there has been a, a strong reaction to that. Where is the exact reality? Maybe somewhere in, in within all this. I think, personally, it is incompetence coupled with a lack of political will and lack of uh, will within the military establishment to tackle these extremists strongly. Um, this battle will decide whether, whether Pakistan turns that this was in, in uh, Time magazine. And this, was, this reminds me of a quote from one of um, uh, the leading experts, when, with this I'll close, um, Steve Cohen, who's a leading ex American expert on Pakistan. And he says that Pakistan is a country uh, which is now threatening or blackmailing others by saying, by going, not saying I'll kill you by putting the gun on the, its own head. And saying, okay, if you are not going to listen to me, I'm going to kill myself. And with these 15, 20 nuclear bombs in my pocket, you would not like uh, that to happen to Pakistan. But, but th these are the kind of challenges. Um, it is more important. Pakistan's security is more crucial because of its nuclear capability also. Uh, where will all those bombs go? Uh, but in an overall context, um, I would say those positive, hopeful signs are also there. Uh, lawyers' community had shown that the secular forces or progressive forces, secular, their view of secular may be different than yours and mine. But those progressive forces also have played a role. Rather than investing in weapons, again and again I come to this because history is replete with so many cases where the Western world supported Pakistan's military. Whether any investment was done in uh, education, no. And just the, the last quote, I had published a book, uh, anecdote of sorts. I had published a book in 2004, and since then, um, that book became popular in Pakistan and India and became a bestseller there and was published by a New York publisher. I received so many calls from friends in government, politicians, bureaucrats also, some police officers also, from Pakistan, asking, Hassan, you published a book. Can you connect us with any publisher in United States? And I would say, well, why don't you first try a Pakistani publisher? Because there are none. During the Afghan war, dozens of publishing houses were established. You want to today publish a book which is very narrow-minded, bigoted on, on religious discourse? You can go to dozens of publishers who will print in 16 color, or what is that called, 32 color print. If you want to publish a book which is different, which is challenging their view, there are none. Why couldn't Bush administration or people within the US administration think about investing $1 million in a good publishing house rather than giving or gifting a $20 million weapon uh, system? Whether it is military industrial complex or something else or lack of understanding or focus, I don't know. But I, I would close with this, that the future, whether we want Pakistan to go that way, is where will we invest? Who will we support within that infrastructure? Any political leader like Benazir Bhutto who will stand for a cause, will there be anyone who will take a stand and support? Or whether again, if uh, General Kiani becomes the head of the state, like Musharraf, again, we'll see close collaboration. Th these are kind of questions. Uh, maybe you may not hear that in, a, in an op-ad in the New York Times, but for Pakistanis, giving a South Asian perspective, these are the kind of questions which face you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hassan. Now you can tell us what you really think, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'm really glad that uh, Hassan was able to give that talk. And uh, one of the reasons is that discussing South Asia should not be just a bunch of Westerners sitting around and talking about what's happening in South Asia. It's important for us to understand the perspective from inside the region. And, and Hassan has done a great job of, 
of doing that. Uh, we have a, a couple of students who have been asked to uh, start off the questioning uh, on this. Uh, so, uh, Shujat, could you uh, ask the first question? So um, this, this definitely has been a challenge, but uh, I would certainly disagree that I, I think this is slowly changing and Pakistanis slowly are feeling that this is actually their own problems. Like I'm, I'm not sure if you uh, watched this recent video where a 17 year old girl was flogged in Sawat and uh, it was uh, like media all over Pakistan had this news uh, running like for 24 hours and like people were outraged by that. So people are cer certainly trying like, you know, understanding that this is their own problem. And, um, but I would, I would like to disagree with some of the generalizations that you made um, about the madrasas. Like, first of all, we need to understand how many percentage of students or probably percent of youths actually go into madrasas, which is very few. And then we also need to under, like, look at the facts that, at the fact that there are very few, madr like, although there are madrasas which are, which are in themselves very few, there are even, there's even a fewer percentage of madrasas that, from which train people to take up militancy and, you know, fight fight war. So I, I, like, this is my personal viewpoint that, you know, what we need to do is not to isolate madrasas altogether, but, you know, we need to understand which ones are, we, we actually do need to understand which ones are the good guys and which one of the, them are bad guys. Certainly the education system is mighty bad in the madrasas, but we need to focus on improving the, those standards. Uh, although initially I had two questions, but I think due to time constraint, I'll just ask one. Uh, what do you, like, do you see that in the future, assuming that Pakistan does become a failed state, although I don't believe that it is a failed state at this point, in the future, if it does become a failed state, do you see in those, even in those extreme conditions that the religious extremists can politically take control of Pakistan? Let me talk about madrasas for a minute first. I'm well aware that there are very various kinds of madrasas, uh, and some of them, particularly those along the border with Afghanistan, have been uh, turned out some pretty toxic graduates. And, and there are madrasas which are old and, and well established, and turn out people who are educated and, and adapted uh, to society. I'm sorry to say I think they're they're a minority, uh, but there are those. I didn't mean to condemn all madrasas. In fact, I don't think I did. Uh, what I did mean to do is to contrast the, uh, the fact that madrasas are uh, one of the two alternatives for public education uh, these days, now that the Urdu medium system has, uh, seems to have practically collapsed. The private system is Primarily English medium, I think, uh, and, but and there are something like, according to the figures I've seen in the Pakistani press, something between fifteen and twenty thousand madrasas. That's not inconsiderable. So, not all. I mean, they may not turn out uh, militants, most of them, but they don't turn out. Uh, m most of them don't turn out graduates who are, shall we say, prepared to deal with the twenty-first century either. Uh, you know, this question of, of failed and failing states is, is really difficult, and I tried to do a little bit about that uh, in the little time that I spent on it. Uh, I, think, I don't think Pakistan's a failed state either. Uh, I think it may be a failing state because uh, there, are asp there are parts of it that are failing. And I really thought, think I tried to get at what I see as the definition of failed in a sense that it, 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 it will be when some, con the, when some swath of territory, some large swath of territory is so out of the control of the central government and so under the control of the elements that uh, Hassan has very well described uh, that uh, they start, they, they not only harbor and foster the, uh, uh, and help 
uh, Al-Qaeda and other uh, toxic organizations, but lead to attacks not just on the West, but all over the region. Um, and at some point, that becomes, shall we say, socially dysfunctional in, reg in, in, in South Asia. So uh, at some point, that will be a definition of failure. Oh, politically. Eh, I don't know. I mean, I I see them taking control of parts of Pakistan. I, I've said uh, in other speeches and other presentations that I could see a a scenario in which most of the Northwest, west of the Indus, and maybe not and not including Baluchistan, but not just the tribal areas, but part, most of the frontier itself, becomes more or less under the domination of, uh, shall we say, Islamist extremist elements. I don't know, I, I, I just have a hard time believing myself that uh, even though they seem to be growing in Punjab, that, that, that Punjab itself or Sindh is vulnerable to what you'd call a takeover where they will run the state. One, but one that doesn't mean, I'll yeah, just go, go on for one minute, the fact that they don't control, uh, they only control parts of the state does not mean that they aren't uh, dangerous. Yeah. One of the relevant facts we've discussed in class is that although uh, many people in the West have a picture of Pakistan as this hotbed of fanaticism, that in any election that's been held, the religious parties, I think the maximum they've ever gotten is something like 12% of the vote. And so, that was probably in 2002. And that was yeah. right. They got so, wiped out in 2008. Right. And, and, and in the most recent election, Nine, they were, they were uh, yeah. decisively defeated. So when the people of Pakistan, ordinary people, as you were talking, Hassan, the ordinary people of Pakistan have a chance to express their voice. It is not for religious extremism. It's for the things they want, which is the things that most people want. Well, but, I certainly didn't mean to imply that. There, no, that I didn't think was, so. It was a hotbed of extremism. No, no. There are a lot of extremists in the wrong areas. Right. Yes. Uh, Chen, would you like to ask the next question? Um, I completely agree with you that the U.S. focus on development assistance is very pertinent at this time, but considering that the, the report also says you know, there's a lot of focus on international cooperation, that the U.S. must engage its allies in this effort to fight the war in Pakistan and Afghanistan, do you think this is realistic? And you know, even if they manage to engage the allies, how, how will they assure that you know, the kind of assistance you want to see to Pakistan is not of military nature, but something more constructive? I think it is um, very realistic um, to, to involve some of the close friends of Pakistan, at least to ensure uh, that there is proper accountability. Uh, if funds will go into development, uh, maybe uh, China can be involved. Uh, in some cases. Uh, Turkey can be involved. Saudi Arabia can be involved. Pakistan probably will be more open. Um, so th there can be a, a consensus because U.S. support of this $1.5 billion per year for development, aid and uh, $3 billion for the military, which I, like Malam, had my, uh, had my doubts and, and actually I'm skeptical whether those $3 billion should be given uh, like this. But uh, the Europeans can be involved and they can uh, also push Pakistan to use that money um, effectively and for, for really for the purpose for which it is given. If money is given for education reform, it should not be used for purely just the salaries of uh, teachers which Pakistan has to give in any case. It should be involved in building new schools. I think it is very realistic, and that will work. As I had mentioned, there are these segments of rule of law, for instance, movement, um, police reforms. Um, it is um, there, there can be other partners with U.S. Europeans mostly, um, Saudi Arabia also. Saudi Arabia, I blame them as certainly uh, they have played actually not uh, part of the role, major role in uh, establishing these madrasa networks in 1980s to produce the kind of militant and extremist who Pakistan wanted to fight in Afghanistan and India. Now maybe Saudis owe something back to Pakistan to invest in, in a public education system. Thanks. Hasib, you have a question? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the voted presentations. Is it on? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, 
I'll, I'll just make two points before uh, specific to uh, uh, Dr. Abbas's presentation and then have a question that would uh, be more general and I'd like to hear fra from all of the speakers today on that. Uh, it's, you made the point that this is a, you mentioned a couple of times that 10 years ago that picture of Osama bin Laden was impossible. I happen to have lived in Peshawar around 97, 96, 94 even at that time and traveled around the country in Pakistan as well. And I recall on walls all around the country uh, graffiti for Arakat al-Mujahideen and for Lashkar al And during Eid times, they would, be, they would collect the skin, uh, goat skin for Jihad al Kashmir and Afghanistan. So I think that's the same phenomena. This is not a phenomena that's 10 years old or seven years old or anything. This has been brewing in Pakistan for a long time. We're only getting to see why it's so dangerous now. Uh, that's one point. Another point you made about the whole idea of the Pakistani military's incompetence, uh, if I could quote you on that uh, in this fight. I think if you look at it, counterinsurgency specific, Balochistan, especially when it comes to targeting leaders of the insurgency, uh, we have a very good anecdote from the Balochistan struggle. You have Bukti, Sardar Bukti, who was in a cave, and the military could strike him very easily. They actually found him in the cave, struck him, and that's it, right? Mullah Omar and others, or Baitullah, and they, these people, they actually even are using communication mean, uh, means that could be traced and others. Is it really a question of incompetence? I think we, uh, the Pakistani military, many people who've studied it, who've worked with them, may, may disagree that I think it's a very competent organization in that, in that region, or specifically in Pakistan. They know what's happening in every corner, and they could do things when they want to. Uh, that's, those are the two points. The general question is more specific to the policy, uh, the Obama administration's policy and how I think what's happening from the region, at least from the way I see it, they, people as well as those who are waiting are observing public opinion in the U.S. Uh, when the Senate Foreign Relations Chairman subscribes to the whole graveyard of empires theory and then you have the House all, all, also going to that same perceptions of people in there, this is an increasingly growing phenomena here. They're reading it. So let's assume one year from now, there isn't much progress tangible. Public opinion has declined in support of this war here, which already is happening. And you have elements in Pakistan who have always played the wait and see game. And they still stick to that. What do you see from that? What I'm trying to project is the worst case scenario in a year from now, where you have public opinion in the US declining the mission, this whole strategy cannot be sustained, and then Pakistan hasn't changed heart. What next? In the beginning, one about this reference that I made about 10 years, and that in year 1999-2000, there were these um, pictures or posters of militant groups. He's absolutely right. The issue is at that time, before the 9-11 scenario, these uh, pictures and fundraisers for Harkatul Mujahideen, lashkar e taiba that was for Kashmir. Yes, there were linkages being developed between lashkar e taiba For instance, they, they had their base camps or training camps in Afghanistan also. But for the ordinary people, all this jihad was about Kashmir. And there was a lot of support at that time uh, that Kashmiris are being killed by the Indian, uh, Indians. And there's no doubt Indian atrocities against ordinary Kashmiris are also very well recorded. Osama bin Laden is a different phenomenon. Today, when Osama bin Laden, I am more worried with Osama bin Laden's picture today then with, uh, and I had seen those posters of Lashkar Taiba, but those are also problematic. But this is more dangerous because today Osama bin Laden stands for something different. It is for global terrorism. Uh, Lashkar Taiba and those fundraisers and posters were for a regional context. That's why today it is more, more serious. Second question also, a very pertinent question about when a Pakistan army wants they can get things done. Bukti, yes, but Bukti was killed after how, how long? When Bukti reacted, it took a while. It took more than, it, he was killed in 2006. He stood up again, he had challenged Musharraf in 2003. It took them three years. Killing top leadership is not difficult. The real problem is second tier leadership and even the support base. That cannot be done unless your law enforcement has a database, it has details, it has intelligence. That I think is lacking. Uh, killing top leaders is, will, killing Al-Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden today will, I, I think, will not resolve the problem. Same Pakistan army can, I think you're right, kill Masood Azhar, head of Lashkar-e-Taiba, 
but even th that will be only part of a small part of the solution. relate to experience that Jeff may remember too. In, uh, we were in Bangladesh during the first uh, Gulf War uh, and you know it was amazing. I don't know if you know anything about Bangladesh. Uh, it, it's all these, um, what do you call them? Uh, the things that people ride on. Uh, cycle rickshaws, bicycle yeah, rickshaws. Rickshaws, rickshaws, yeah. They all of a sudden, half the rickshaws in town had a picture of Saddam Hussein on it. This really bothered some of the people in the in my embassy, and I, you know, but we lived with it. Nothing happened really. We had a little trouble, but nothing much. And then the Gulf War was over, and damn if all those pictures didn't disappear overnight. So I mm. wonder, you know, if mm. when when Osama disappears or in, uh, proves himself imp impotent, uh, that some of these uh, pictures on the trucks may disappear too. Uh, anyway. Uh, the second one is, you know, I I don't know any, I don't know enough about the army to comment except uh, it's always it's uh, I think that's our problem. None of us know enough about the army. I mean, there is, uh, and I have I've discussed this with other people. There is we don't know whether some of the officer corps, some of the jawans, are divided between uh, two different ideologies or not. We don't know what's happening. I, at least I don't. If you do, let us know. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yes. My question is to the ambassador. Sir, uh, when was the first time, or uh, talking about uh, the yearly timeline, that the United States uh, started to recognize the Taliban as a threat? And what was the initial strategy to deal with the Taliban? I'm talking about the 90s. Well, you know, I think there was, I wasn't around in those days, but I think there was some romantic feeling about the Taliban in early in 1994 and 5 when they first emerged and started putting down uh, a lot of disorder, uh, taking away roadblocks and, you know. But that ro romantic feeling dissipated very, very quickly when they found out that when we saw what they were doing not just politically, but socially and otherwise, too. By the time I got to Pakistan in 98, they were certainly, we were certainly not friendly with them. Uh, our contacts with them in those days uh, were fairly unfriendly, but primarily designed to try and find a way to get them to uh, get rid of Osama bin Laden, throw him out of the country, uh, which, of course, uh, was unsuccessful, as we know. Several of us were discussing that very question uh, just before this, and it reminded me, I, I think that when the Taliban first came in, which was a total surprise to the U.S., it was sort of like those that scene in a Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. We kept looking back and saying, who are these guys? <laughs> yeah. We just didn't, uh, we didn't understand. We didn't yeah. know. Lisa, did you want to say something? Use the, use the... Uh, I arrived at post in Islamabad, uh, where I worked as a political officer for two years um, in August uh, 1994. And a couple weeks later, a group called the Taliban rolled into Kandahar, led by then Interior Minister Nasimullah Babar. Uh, but I can tell you, working at the embassy in Islamabad, nobody knew where they came from, what they were about, who they were. Um, so I would say that confusion sort of prevailed at first. And then, uh, as Ambassador Lundstedt said, you know, some exploration, but I would say saying a romantic view is stretching it because I, I don't know of anybody who had any kind of romantic view. Well, it romantic was more might be a little strong. I mean, but maybe, but maybe, maybe some people do. So I, I happen to know the guy who was, uh, I won't mention him, who felt kind of uh, like they might be the answer to the, pro to the problems of the Afghan people. How long he felt that way, whether it was three days or three weeks, I don't know. But I guess that reflects some of the confusion. It was definitely people like myself and others who were in the embassy at the time, you know, to, didn't see it that way, but you're probably right. There were probably some people within the bureaucracy who just hoped, because Afghanistan had been so unstable in that period, so everybody wanted there to be some kind of stability 
Um, so I just wanted to spell that because I hear that all the time from Afghans. Why did you support the Taliban? We never supported the Taliban. I would, I would uh, add to that, if I may, that uh, this comes up specifically in Ahmed Rashid's book, The Taliban. Ahmed Rashid's a good friend and a very intelligent, uh, sharp observer. But at this point, he's, in my view, mistaken. The United States, to my knowledge, never supported, quote, unquote, the Taliban. And when I was in uh, Hawaii in the U.S. Pacific Command in 1996, and the Taliban finally rolled into Kabul, our commander, four-star admiral, we pay attention when four-star admirals do things, he was going to Russia. So I said, well, he's going to Russia. The Russians are very interested in Afghanistan. We better set, tell him something about these people we know nothing about. This is now two years after they first kind of near emerge on the scene. We better tell him something because the Russians will bring it up and the admiral ought to be able to at least say, oh, yes, I heard about that. And, uh, you know, we don't have a big policy statement. So I think it's useful because, again, I hear this also from Afghans, but particularly from Pakistanis, that, oh, you Americans created the Taliban, or you tolerated or supported them. And I could only uh, strongly reinforce uh, Lisa's comment that, in my experience, that's just not the case. If I will just add one line in. There's a new report by General Nasirullah Babur, which substantiates uh, what Lisa and Jack are saying. He was the one who had supported uh, Taliban initially. He has a detailed interview, which is on the internet. And Nasir the Baba, the interior minister, then well, is considered as, in some ways, the major supporter. And he says that he was the first one who informed uh, uh, the, the U.S. Embassy. Uh, so I mean, again, that is one important uh, piece of information, which is on the web. Just Google again. I keep on talking about Google. Google Nasir the Baba, Taliban, the year 1994. Thank yeah, you. Robert told me that he had done it when I was there. Sure. He, was the, he, was, he thought he was very proud. Yeah, he was the godfather yeah, yeah. of the, the, the Taliban. Uh, did you have a question, Armagan? Uh, as early as 1994, there were like there was an attack planned by the Taliban on the Wall Street Center, which really didn't work out. And even in 1996, there were the covert bombings in, uh, on the U.S. embassies in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. No, actually, they were in, in a building in covert Saudi Arabia. And they were directly linked to the Taliban. And I think things have been not hostile since then. Although nothing concrete was done then. The US intelligence, Robert Baer thinks that it was some other Shia group. And the, the 1994 World Trade Center also was some, some Arabic Arabs who were involved, not necessarily Taliban. That's true. Yeah. Maybe. We don't know. But there's, don't know there's, lots of, there's lots of murk. Out there, uh, we're we're running a little bit over, but we'll take one or two more questions uh, back there. Uh, we turn these questions over why so much of the aid is military aid, but I mean I can't help but wonder whether there are economic reasons behind that in arms um, production. I mean I just wonder if you guys have any comments on that, and also um, what role does the Obama administration, if any, play in, uh, in the ISI and its relationship with the military? Well, what was the first question? The first question was whether we provide military aid because I guess because it's of economic benefit to U.S. military manufacturers. Is that was the, the, the gist of it? Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know, probably, but not much to Pakistan, I'm sure. Uh, the second question, is the Obama administration connected in some way with the ISI's uh, t links or to how the does Taliban? It, how, what's the question? How does the how does the Well, I think they probably have done and will do something about it. I mean, it may. Uh, be more verbal than anything else, but I suspect that we have already mentioned that and that we will continue to mention it. And didn't somebody say today, didn't you say, Jack, that uh, somebody uh, had a very stiff conversation with uh, the chief of army, the Pakistani chief of army staff over this? Uh, remember, that one, but it's, well, it's entirely, it's entirely I think possible. probably, I think probably we've already had some pretty, pretty firm conversations on it. I might offer a thought on the, on the, uh, the preceding question, though, and a, one, a different way to look at this 
is that for over half of its history, Pakistan's been ruled by the military. Mm -hmm. So as a nation state, we deal with it, who's ever in charge in the fellow nation state. And if it's military guys who particularly want military things and we think, well, we have to have a good relationship with them, oftentimes, in my personal view, American policy towards Pakistan's been very, very short-sighted. So, you know, the general of the day says, well, we need these things from you Americans, otherwise you don't love us, then we provide those things in an effort to build a relationship or maintain a relationship. It is not necessarily a wise or long-term uh, sage policy, but I, I would see it as something as much more mechanical than that as opposed to, or much more mechanical yeah. like that, as opposed to something that's, oh, you know, it benefits Lockheed or, or some U.S. Uh, business. Yeah. Joan, you had a question? Did you? Yes, I actually had two questions, but I'm just going to ask one because it's so late. Um, given that we have established that most of the problems that are happening in South Asia are internal problems, and given the fact that, speaking as a foreigner, I mean, we have... We have the impression of Americans as sometimes being almost modern-day imperialists and you know poking into other people's business. Um, my question, which might be a bit provocative, and I'm, I, I just wanted some answers, would be: What right does the America, like does the United States of America, have in once again getting involved in South Asia? I mean, it is their problem, and they might have helped start some of it, but. What right, or how would they justify their involvement? I would say. I'd say you ought to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you used to tell me when you were the ambassador. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just reverting to past well, habits. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I would first I'd give an answer, and then I'd also turn the question around because I think you've raised a very, a very uh, interesting point. The, the answer to the question is, and this is what President Obama said, it says that there are people there in Pakistan and Afghanistan who are trying to kill Americans. And so the, the first duty of any country is to protect its citizens. So we have to deal at a minimum with that issue. And of course, how you do that is, is uh, up, up to question. But would that justify actually entering the country? I mean, that's where all the from by going into Iraq, going into Afghanistan, would that justify? Well, I would say, again, now we have to... You have the right to protect your own borders, right. but this is outside your borders. Yeah, well, those people are there and they're, they're plotting. I think that would be the answer. Uh, and uh, as we discussed this morning, that I think most uh, Afghans, and they're actually reliable opinion polls in Afghanistan, surprisingly, uh, would show that most Afghans support the presence at this point of outside forces because they don't want the Taliban. Um, but, you know, you raise another interesting point, which is what about the role of other Asian countries? What about Singapore or Malaysia or Indonesia, um, Thailand? Um, if these are Asian countries. They, if they may share some values. They may or may not have a greater uh, understanding of the situation. And should they perhaps be uh, more involved in this issue, or other countries, and, and uh, of course the administration has just uh, convened this regional roundtable, bringing in a number of countries, but I, I think that they certainly have a good point there, that it shouldn't be just an American initiative and an American effort. I think in response to that, um, I would say that most of the Asian countries have a lot of, I mean, they're all building up and they're all developing countries. I wouldn't use the word third world here, but they are very much involved in trying to get their own act together. And so in terms of trying to help someone while you are trying to stay afloat, I think that would be almost over, over trying to overachieve. Maybe. OK, we'll have to discuss. Yeah, this yes. is a long discussion. Yes. And we'll have to have another time. But, but certainly, they may have more knowledge about how things could be done than, than we might have, because they're dealing with some of the same problems and same, same issues. Yeah. Uh, yes? into Afghanistan to uh, overthrow the Taliban regime. Uh, and the only solution the United States thought was military solution. So um, uh, my question is, to what extent do you think military solution is the right solution for Afghanistan? Maybe Jack. Jack, you discussed well, that I, this morning. Yeah, we yeah. talked about this this morning. Let me, let me start with a, a 
disagreement with your premise that the U.S. only tried a military solution. As the good Ambassador Milam and his predecessors from 1996 through 2001 uh, attempted with uh, more enormous persistence and, and I, I mean dealing, talking to Taliban leaders and trying to get them to turn over, somehow deal with Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden as an individual, Al-Qaeda as a group or movement or whatever you want to term it. So for over five years, U.S. diplomacy tried very, very hard. It was not in the public eye. It was below the radar screen for most Americans. Tried very hard to do this. And I think of Al Eastham coming back, this friend of ours, in, from talking to these guys and the enormous frustration of getting nowhere. I mean, nowhere. And trying very, very hard with inducements, with sticks and carrots and, I don't know, other fruits and vegetables and, and <laughs> rocks and who knows what. Very, very hard. And if you'll recall, right after September 11, the United States issued an ultimatum to the Taliban rulers in Afghanistan to turn over Osama bin Laden and the people that we believe behind the 9-11 attacks uh, or face military retribution. And they refused to do that. So they had an opportunity, and we cannot sort of, you know, it's not an opportunity that can go on for years, decades, but they had an opportunity to act and they chose not to. So they took, they took a course of action. They thought that they would uh, survive and they found that their rule was actually based on a very slender basis and therefore fell very, very quickly, much more quickly than many analysts thought it would. So I, I would, I would take, uh, take issue that the U.S. only tried kind of a military approach. And this kind of gets to the question, our, our previous uh, question, which is, well, all right, now the United States, and I would, I would ar uh, caution you not to conflate Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, these are they're very, very different situations, so I'd caution you not to do that. Uh, at least in my opinion. The, if you look at the, two, at the uh, Afghanistan situation, the United States acted militarily after trying diplomacy for an extended period of time and then issuing this ultimatum. The U.S. acted militarily to remove a direct threat to the United States of America, and oh, by the way, not just to us, but to our European allies, to our friends in Pakistan, to our friends in India, and to our friends in other places around the world. So not just to the United States. And we cannot, as Americans and as responsible government officials, we cannot stand and wait. I mean, how, how could the president or any American official turn to the voters and say, well, sorry, you know, we can't go into this other country. And they, yes, they came over here and blew up a shopping mall and killed 200 people, but, you know, we couldn't go next door and do anything to, about that. So uh, an American official cannot survive or, or cannot, you know, execute his or her responsibilities without taking some sort of action. So. U.S. takes military action. Well, now that we've taken the military action, what is our responsibility? Do we not, and I would argue very strongly, although this is not clear in the, the current white paper, I would argue strongly that the American people have, and the American government has a moral responsibility to the people of Afghanistan who placed hope in us. Now, if you talk to any, I, I promise you, if you talk to any American who served there, the, the reaction of American soldiers and, and uh, citizens who've served in Afghanistan is extraordinarily warm to the Afghan people because of the reception they've received from the people of Afghanistan. And so the people who go to serve in Afghanistan look forward to going back. And they, they want to go back because they think they're doing a good mission and they're, I, mean, I just talked to a guy who'd been running one of these provincial reconstruction teams a couple of weeks ago and how you know, all the time he spent away from his family, all the frustrations and dinky, drinking 10 cups of tea and then still getting back to where he would begin, had been at the first cup of tea that he, he, then he'd go to the girls' school and he would talk to the little girls in the school. And his, I mean, he practically, uh, you know, was in tears in responding or re recounting this story of how, how moving this was to see these little girls learning and asking him questions in, in, as they were learning English or as they were studying their mathematics or what have you. So there, there is a, this is part of why the United States remains in Afghanistan, and to me, not just for counterterrorism reasons, but for a, a moral responsibility that we have to do something. Otherwise, we face the kind of questions we've heard from our Pakistani friends. Where did you go in 1990? Now, that's a long issue, and there are a lot of reasons why. There are a lot of things going on in 1990 besides Afghanistan that we did not pay attention, but you know, we'd be back in the same position. It, it's the same kind of problem. I mean, we have no answers that we can give here today. But it's the same kind of problem if you say, well, you may not intervene in other countries. Well, okay, then, then we should do nothing in Rwanda. We should do nothing in Darfur because it's another country. So it's a very, I'm not saying there's an answer in any of this, but I just pose that to you as a real challenge for the United States government or any government, be it London or Paris or Berlin or Bangkok or any place, 
Uh, this is a major challenge that all of us have to, to cope with and think about. Can I just say something? Just to the question about what are we sought in military victory. First of all, I've been a participant in the yeah. diplomatic efforts that led up to failure before 9-11. Before uh, I think we were not seeking a military solution at that time. We had to turn to it. But then, Jack, if you remember, as after, the, after we did invade Afghanistan, we then put together, because and I did part of this myself, a big multilateral effort to bring development to Afghanistan, to try to, I mean, it, it turned out to be not very effective and not very successful, I'm sorry to say, but we put together several billions of dollars. Uh, we had lots of teams out there trying to, trying to build schools and, and roads and, and so forth. So I don't think we ever saw, quote, a military solution as the only solution, and certainly after the last few years, we certainly don't now. We certainly, the, the whole Obama strategy is, is a military part of a larger solution. Yeah. But, uh, no, on, on, this, on this issue, when, when we had all these intentions of doing all this development in Afghanistan, and, um, and then our government decided to invade Iraq, right. It all sort of fizzled out, and, and would you say that that is part of the reason that the Taliban has grown stronger and it's and we're having problems today? Well, I think Jack and I probably agree that uh, at least I th I always thought, and, and the reason I gave up on the effort was uh, the, that the Iraq War was a terrible mistake. It should have never been done, never been happened. And I was in the State Department. Actually, it was kind of post career. I had been I was called back in. 2000 and late 2001 to try to help put together this effort. And in the spring of, actually a year before the Iraq invasion, you could feel the air going out of the Iraqi effort uh, because... The Afghan effort. I'm sorry, the, the, Af the Afghan effort, yes indeed. Thank you for straightening me out. The air was being sucked out and at a faster and faster rate as we built up for the, for the Iraqi venture. And then, of course, we screwed that one up, too. But it was, that was a terrible mistake, yes. And I don't know that Afghanistan wouldn't be a hell of a lot better off if we hadn't done it. But the, that's, you know, that's the way things happened. Well, thank you all. We've run considerably over time. But it's been, uh, th please thank our.